tell the audience about how you got started in real estate? Steve, I'm uh, excited to have you here. I think home building is a business from a third party that I think is very difficult, and I'm sure you can appreciate how difficult it is. Financing's difficult, lumpy cash flow, so anybody who can do it as well as you have, I'm excited to talk to because I think I can learn a lot from you. It's good to be here. So let's start out with kind of your backstory. Uh, your son, Boo, told me that you started working at a grocery store uh, a while ago, so let's start there. Probably goes back before that. Um, I grew up in a middle and lower class family, seven children. Uh, there was never enough money. My mother made powdered milk. Uh, we lived off of ground wheat. She made bread. She's from Italy. She's an immigrant. And there was always a scarcity mentality growing up. And there was always the thought process of this is kind of your lot in life. And I had friends who grew up in uh, different circumstances. So it was always in my back of my mind. I wanted more, but kind of didn't think I would get there. And blue collar uh, was comfortable for me. And so uh, off of an LDS mission, I began working for Macy's grocery store and uh, thought this was my lot in life. I wanted to become a store director and Worked a lot of hours and had a great deal of satisfaction. Tremendous amount of satisfaction, actually. So how did you get into real estate then? Uh, I didn't jump directly into real estate. I had an acquaintance that introduced me to a business called Title Insurance and thought that I would be good at it. And I uh, applied for First American Title out of Salt Lake uh, with a gentleman na named Mike Corgan. Um, and uh, he hired me on the spot. And um, he kind of gave me a list of what my responsibilities would be like in two weeks and uh, gave me the dress code. And I had one suit left from my mission and a couple of grungy white shirts and a couple of grungy ties and thought, I don't know if I accept the job or not, but the pay I kept looking at his offer and um, at some point thought, I, I'm not going to do it. I just don't know that I can go talk to highly intelligent, motivated real estate agents when my world had been free to lay representatives and wonder bread and um, representatives that I was comfortable with. So I stewed on it for about seven days and then just woke up one morning and thought um, my body's going to give out at some point. And so um, I will take the jump. So that's how I got started was at First American in Utah County. So how did you transition from working in title insurance with the, the brilliant realtors to becoming a, you know, one of the, the largest home builder in Utah. I started calling on um, real estate agents at the beginning of my career and realized that they were one-off transactions. And so I had a clientele of maybe 80 or 90 agents in Salt Lake and Utah County. And it was, it was tedious work. And then I started calling on home builders and started calling on developers and realized that I probably had more like-mindedness towards them than the one-off real estate transaction. And so I started um, getting to know these developers who um, probably made me more frustrated about where I was at in life and what their lifestyle was like. I was wearing uh, a suit during the summer and a white shirt and a tie and they were wearing shorts and golf shirts and calling me from the golf course. So in my mind, I had concocted this perception that developers didn't work and developers kind of just had cash flow that I didn't have. And so I was intrigued. And as I began to um, really dig deep, I realized the stresses and pressures associated with it. And there were, it was lumpy, as you indicated, and it was hit and miss. And there were probably more losses that I witness than wins. And, um, I thought that would never be for me, but I probably spent three years, um, trying to amass a little bit of knowledge to think maybe I could venture out. So 
independent of first American title, I was moonlighting and was tying up small parcels of land in uh, kind of infield pieces and sneaking out to city meetings trying to understand this business without um, asking these guys how to do it and what to do it. So That's so impressive. So the first project I did was in Pleasant Grove. It was a family parcel, and it was 10 lots, and I made $65,000 on 10 lots, and I thought, this is great money. I can double my income. It took me a few hours, and one day I slipped and told a uh, client what I had done, and he said, could I look at what you've done? And he showed me how much money I left on the table by saying yes and not understanding what the nuances of entitlement work was. What? What were some of those lessons? Was he like, you could have just sold it for more or you should have redesigned the site? Or what? No, 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 no. I understood the dynamics of selling. Like retail is very easy to figure out. It's what somebody will pay. So that was a, a very interesting um, nuance, but I understood the market would dictate retail. I couldn't change retail. When I went to develop, I paid the engineer what he thought. He engineered it the way that he thought it should be engineered. Um, there was no VE, value engineering. It was essentially what's the easiest path for him. And then when I went to the city, they took a bite of the apple and they said, oh, we want this and we want this and we want this and we want this. And they had a Christmas list all put together for me. And I didn't understand that that was something that they were asking for. And so I said yes to every single item that they wanted. And then I hired a contractor to come in and bid on the work. And I only hired one contractor because I didn't know who to ask. And I saw a truck one day on... Uh, <laughs> Uh, on on site uh, they were just driving through the area and so I called them and they did a really nice bid for me and it looked professional it was a one-page document and um, I hired them and I went to Central Bank and Central Bank said oh here's our fee structure and I said oh that's wonderful you'll lend me the money <laughs> and so I signed the bank documents and off we went and the reality is if there were not uh, divine intervention in the process I probably would have lost money but the market was vibrant enough that I was able to recoup my cost. So my budgeting structure was essentially add up all of your receipts. Here's what you made. And, and you know, that was essentially how I approached it. So it was a very archaic approach, but as you're indicating, this was pre-internet. This was pre me being humble enough to ask people for help. This was pre me having resources. So this was me cutting my teeth on what I had learned and seen and um, I spent evenings at um, city council meetings understanding the process. So I understood I stood up, I dressed nice, I spoke well, I used my first and last name. And like I understood the nuances and I went through. And I don't think anybody knew I was an imposter um, other than maybe I was shaking more than normal. Um, and I probably overdressed and I probably overgroomed, and I was probably too polite. Other than that, I think it was kind of mainstream. I think I did a decent job. And what year was this? 98. 98. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and so you met this guy, told you all the money that you'd left on the table. Then did you optimize? Did you, did you go work for someone or what was the path like after that? Um, well, you know, you have these um, divergent points in life. And I realized that I needed to make a mental decision as to whether my path was going to be development real estate development, or if it was going to be title. And I started looking at my boss's boss thinking, that's my path in three to seven years. And do I want to do that? Do I want to wear a suit to work every day? And do I want the security blanket of a W-2? And do I want the security blanket of the handcuffs that they had put on me, which was food allowances, a company vehicle? Um, so I went and had a talk with my dad. And my dad said, absolutely, you take the safe path, son. You have a W-2. He worked for the same corporation for 37 years. And so that was kind of where I went after that experiment. Um, and then you continue to w meet with these people and you think, I like the way they think. I like their process. Um, so I chose a, an alternative path, which was I was going to save every dollar I could save that didn't go to children's clothing and insurance and food. I would rat hole in the bank. In 2000, I had saved up living expenses for two years, and I resigned on January 2nd of 2000. It would have been the first, um, but Y2K was going to be when the world ended, and I kind of didn't want to be unemployed um, if the world was ending. So cautiously, 
I went into <laughs> Lane Gidney, who was my uh, direct manager, and I resigned. And consequently had um, indigestion and bowel issues for probably the next year on the decision that I had made, which was abandoning what I felt my, my parents wanted me to do, what I felt like my wife wanted me to do, and what was responsible because I went from a very safe W-2 to a 1099. Um, and that was a troubling time in my career. How was the market at that point? Um, <clears throat> I mean, anyone, you know, me or Boo's age kind of only knows great markets for the most part. What was the market like in 2000? And I was going to ask you how you felt leaving your job, but I think you kind of painted a good picture. I would say the market was warm. I would say that there were opportunities. There was not as much competition. There were not uh, developers to speak of. There was lots of inventory, meaning there were fields everywhere. Everything that's now built out was was ready to be harvested. Uh, lending institutions were willing to lend. They were not cautious. They had not lived through the fire of 08. And you did not have to be overly sophisticated. It was still relationship-based. And the individuals that I decided to partner with uh, were healed enough that financing was fairly easy, sales were fairly easy, construction, um, labor was fairly easy. So I would say it was a very nice time to enter the market. It was not a fire hose experience. And you were rewarded based on the hours and the labor that you put into it. And can you describe these guys that you partnered with? Who they were? Yeah, they were about 10 years, still are 10 years older than I am. <laughs> um, they understood development. They grew up in entrepreneur families. They understood um, risk better than I did. They had a better appetite for risk than I did. There wasn't a deal probably for the first three years that I did that I did not second guess um, numbers that we had put together. We certainly were not as sophisticated at the time as uh, I am currently. Uh, the performer was much weaker. The um, plus minus category was never contemplated. The risk was never contemplated. We did not have a project for seven years that even remotely considered a loss because the market took out all the mistakes that we had made on our estimating. Um, and I was rudderless in a fast and furious career that I had chosen. I took the path of being transactional rather than building a company. And so I had partnered with four or five different local builders and I would find a parcel. I would entitle it and then I would go to these builders and say, I want you to build it and finance it and we're going to do the marketing. You do the construction and then we'll split net proceeds. So we had um, a really good game going and a really good cash flow going. But I spent nine years of my life not building a company. I was essentially, I had created a job for myself, which was the security that I had when I was in the title industry. And I had multiple sources of income. The, the um, one redeeming factor that I had leaving corporate America and becoming a developer was nobody could fire me. If I got sideways with a builder, uh, for one reason or another, I knew that I had four or five other clients that I could shift my business to. So there was a sense of satisfaction in doing what I love doing, which was procuring property, financing, entitlement. And I have never had a love or passion for the vertical side of home building. So neither have I. <laughs> so um, I was going to ask you, you've done so many of these, uh, you know, large farms. And I've, I think I've gotten two farmers to ever sell to me. Do you have any secrets about working with farmers? Um, I don't know that there's secrets. I think it's probably short-sighted to think that you're going to knock on somebody's door, create a relationship, um, assure them that you will take something that is so personal. There's, there's the element that's forgotten in this industry, which is its livelihood. So when I tear out homes and when I tear down trees, they're emotional trees. They're emotional houses. The fields that I am plowing up to create roads are really exciting for the buyer that I'm selling the home to and really, really, really challenging for the seller of the property. And so I think that it's really hard to be a listener in this business. And the reality is when we go in, the greatest thing that we have to do as developers is be responsible enough to slow down. 
and listen. I, I bought a parcel um, four years ago from a gentleman that I got to know really well. And um, I had closed on the property, and he called me one day, and he said, I have a problem. And in my mind, he immediately go to financing. He's made a mistake on a 1031, or he's made a mistake on the contract. And sure enough, he said, I've made a mistake on the contract. Um, I want to plow my field, or I want to harvest my first crop of alfalfa on the field. And it kind of interfered with when I wanted to dig my first phase. So I said, Stan, it's going to be a problem because I have things slated for in the spring. The next words will always shift how I view the world, and that is, he said, my wife is dying. And I just want to sit with her in the tractor that I sat in for 45 years. So I retracted, and I said, Stan, you can have the whole summer. And I think when you realize that the farmer is kind of the backbone of America. And the sacrifices that they have made for years were irrelevant to me pulling up with dollar signs and what I wanted to do. So I paused, I met him out there and watched and just kind of took in the moment that what I do is on one side, really noble to think that I will create housing for people that don't have a house. And I can drive into a community and um, see life happening. I can see parties. I can see return missionaries. I can see farewells. I can see funerals. And there's a great deal of satisfaction. But there's the other side, which is this isn't just a vacant parcel. This is something that somebody has driven to, in some cases, for 50 years, 60 years, and they can remember as a child their dad being out there. So when I buy multi-generational farms, there's a couple things that I always remember, and that is this is not going to be around money. This is going to be around what they want their legacy to be. And just to include them in the process, and like as crazy as it might sound, to jump in your truck and go grab breakfast and just talk. So a lot of the larger parcels I have bought um, have been done on a handshake and a lot of them have been done at a cafe and a lot of them have been done after a year of understanding what their needs are. And I would say that those individuals have become an integral part of my life and they're not just people that I bought ground from, they're people that I have kind of built my life and legacy around. And I want them to be proud of what we have done together. And it's a repurposing of the ground. I'm not looking at it as dollars. And I have left money on the table because they have needs. I paid more for ground than I probably should have because it becomes emotional. Um, but in the end, I feel like my greatest referral is to have Farmer A call Farmer B and say, how is it dealing with Steve Maddox individually? And that's the greatest sales tool you have is your legacy. Not he took advantage of me or not read his contract twice or not, not, not. And I have to constantly remind myself, Edge Homes is an inanimate object, which means nothing. So under the name of Edge, I can do whatever I want to do. But at the end of the day, I don't want to run in a grocery store when I see somebody that I bought ground from or that I've done a transaction with. So I think I've looked at it and just said, I will not enter into transactions with individuals that I can't perform on. And I will know enough about the land that I don't have to retrade and disappoint and rock people's lives. That was awesome. That was fantastic. Um, I want to, <clears throat> you talked about working with these farmers and kind of including them with the process. I want to take a minute and talk about, you do massive master plan communities, obviously. And I want to go from when you first see the piece of property to the entire process to when you sell out an entire community. Let's start with you find that piece of property. How do you even begin to think about what that's going to look like? Are you thinking single family homes over here and commercial over here? What drives those decisions? So um, I think it's probably no secret that um, there are a million different ways to develop property. Um. I live on the property for a night and a day and a night and a day. And I watch the sun come up and I watch the sun go down and I feel the wind 
you know, with a campfire. On Thanksgiving, I went to a parcel with my family, and we lit a fire, and we shot guns, and we raced our um, UTVs around. And I thought, okay, if I live in this community, what do I want the roads to feel like? What do I want to wake up to? What view do I want to see? What wind do I want to see? And where do I want the roads? Where do I want the community center to be? Where do I want the entrances to be? Where is going to be an optimal place to have a backyard and where are memories going to happen? And so at the beginning of my career, I would tie up a parcel and I would order a survey and I would say, here's the survey, Mr. and Mrs. Engineer, design it for me. And it was all done on efficiency and it was done on, this is the way to maximize lots. Um, Maybe two or three years into my career, I just thought, I have made so many freaking mistakes. Like, why did I put a road there? And why a cul-de-sac there? And who would want to wake up with that in their backyard instead of that? And so I started picturing, man, where are the master bedroom windows? What is the kitchen going to look at? And how do I orient this? And so if you live on the property and you, I on the steep stuff, I will go up there with my horse for days and ride it and just like put a pin down and say, okay, if this is a residence, how do I orient this? And if this is a road, how do I orient this? And how do I work with the mountain rather than against the mountain? And how do I know this ground? And now when I drive up into a community, there are no surprises when I build a road. It's like, yep, this is exactly how I envisioned it. So I guess I would just say, I'm not good enough to envision. I'm not good enough to look at a county map and say, oh, this is great. This is what I'm going to do. Um, I am still old school walk it, ride it, live it, throw your bedroll out, live on the ground, listen to the coyotes at night, and then say, okay, this is what I want the community to look and feel like. So the surprising phase of my career was buried maybe 12 or 14 years ago. Now I look at it and just think, I will not have another surprise and I will not live with regrets. And I will drive into communities and say, I remember sleeping on this when it was a field or it was scrub oak. That's, I think, one of the reasons I want to have a lot of home builders on this show is because I think home building is arguably the most intimate segment of development. You're creating places where people have Thanksgiving, they have Christmas, kids grow up. Um, And I, I really appreciate what you've been saying about how you think about that because I love, I just love how thoughtful you are with this. And... So after you design the site, what does day one look like, I guess, as far as groundbreaking goes? How does that look like across the organization? Are you starting with just single family? Are you starting with townhomes? Are you thinking of condos? How does that how does that all work? I would say groundbreaking starts long before groundbreaking traditional. So groundbreaking for me is exactly what you're saying is how do I launch this? How do I hit the velocity that I have to hit in order to make the money work? And what is my velocity and what is my sales price and what is my cost? So the amount of work that goes into my due diligence is probably um, as intense as anything that I will ever do because I, again, can't make the monetary mistakes. If you're, if, if you're wrapping up without going into too much detail, but people can do the math. If you're wrapping up $90 million worth of hard real estate a year and $90 million worth of development, so your total land budget is somewhere between $150 and $200 million a year. If you're off by 5%, you're not good at what you do. And the eyes and the attention to detail are um, exhausting at times. Uh, I think that there is the misnomer of you go tie up a piece of ground, you send it to an engineer, you go to the city, and then you break ground. And there are people that do that. I would never. Short term, and they're bankrupt, and then they're trying to get a job to learn how to do this. And there is not a one-size-fits-all, here's the manual, go do it. It doesn't exist. I couldn't write it. My peers couldn't write it. The MRED program at the U couldn't write it. They try, and they give great experience. But the reality is it's still roll up your sleeves and boots on the ground, and it's a it's a financing approach but it's a, you better know your retail and you better know the market and you better be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you're a dumb shit. And as soon as you start reading the news of how good you are, the mistakes will pile up on themselves. And as soon as you start thinking you're above making mistakes, then they will happen. And you see it happen with referendums. You see it happen with denials. You see people that are so arrogant in their approach that they just anticipate city council approval. Um, So for me, it's the planning beforehand. And then there's very little gratification for me on the groundbreaking. I am done with communities. 
at the entitlement phase and the horizontal phase, and then I turn it over. So on our large communities, um, ideally, we would like to have all three product types and a clubhouse going in phase one. And I want to step back a little bit. So, I mean, you said it earlier, you're kind of disrupt disrupting this natural field and trees and all that stuff. And I imagine a lot of neighbors get kind of upset because, you know, Farmer Joe used to have his cows out here and now there's a bunch of houses. How do you think about working with communities? Because what I think you do is a net benefit to everyone in the community. They can access your parks, your trails, all of these big master plan community benefits. They get enjoyment from that, specifically from the retail and office components to these as well. So how do you think about these conversations with these neighbors? And I guess, what do you want them to understand? Uh, Your description is not the description that I have ever had, which is I have never had a neighbor say this is a net benefit. I have never had a neighbor say anything to me that has been positive in nature. I will. Um, I thought early on in my career that that would be the case. I bought a parcel in Provo from the Cox family, which was the um, drive-in movie in Provo. It was dilapidated. The screens were falling. It became a very derelict parcel. But I realized that the community as a whole, it was an icon for, and people had spent their childhood there. So my first meeting at Provo City Mayor Billings, I stood up and I was really good at what I was doing. Um, I was brand new and I had a list all prepared and I rattled off this lengthy speech and realized that I um, was combated with residents of Provo City that had been residents for 80 years. And they were friends with Mayor Billings and they talked about the travesty of having this go away and the travesty of having no community sense and et cetera. They, they blasted me. They, they obliterated me emotionally and it became a very emotionally charged meeting where I was the greedy developer. I was the one that was taking away their childhood dreams of rolling in and enjoying something that I was taking away. So it became this, you know, what would be a better use of this property is to redo a theater downtown, an outdoor theater. And these old guys had come up with their own performa as to why this should be um, reinvigorated. And I was denied. And it was a slam dunk in my mind. This was easy. This was fixing the community. And I made a commitment to myself that I would never show up at a council meeting again without full neighborhood support. So that project took me a year. So my very first meeting is with the community. And I have not been to a community meeting yet. And I probably attend 10 a year. Every project that we do, I have a neighborhood community meeting. And I have never attended a community meeting where it has not been an absolute hostile environment. Other developers opt not to do that and then have that hostility at a city council meeting. I will have two or three within a community prior to going to the city so that I understand what the desires of the community are. Let's talk about that for a little bit, how those initial meetings go. Because, I I mean, we live in a culture of nimbyism where I'm sure people think your product is great, but they'd rather have it somewhere else and they want to still have the pumpkin farm or the sheep farm or the cows in their backyard. So let's talk about those meetings and how they go. And I mean, I didn't know that you had full community support by the time you went to city council. That is like miraculous to me for the scale of development that you do. So let's talk about that for a little. Uh, I used to take the approach that I'm going to put up really beautiful pictures and I'm going to have vignettes of what the pool is going to look like and what the clubhouse is going to look like. And it became very apparent that my vision and other people's vision do not align. And I attended a neighborhood meeting where I had shown exactly what you were referencing, which is the park and trail. And I had a lady that was probably, at the time, 10 years my senior, ask me three poignant questions that I didn't understand what she was getting at. The first question was, who designed the trails? And I said, I did, methodically. And I went through the rationale. Number two was, have you ever been threatened emotionally, physically, or spiritually that you were going to be raped? And I stared. I didn't understand the question. 
I said, I have not. And she said, have you ever been threatened physically, spiritually, or mentally on a dark sidewalk? I said, I have not. And she said, your trails are abhorrent to me. And she called him a rape corridor. I was offended because I thought, no, no, no. I laid this out. This is my plan. I have methodically gone through this in the rationale. And I had to recoil and say, this lady's right. Her name was Paige. Paige is right. I have designed these with me in mind, which is me. You want to pick a fight with me, then let's go the rounds. Like, I'm not intimidated when it's dark. I don't, I walk with a German shepherd. I don't think about, I didn't have little girls at the time. I didn't think about any of these things. And I paused the meeting and I took the biggest, fattest, chubbiest marker that I could get. And I said, my plan is horrible. I need another meeting with the community. And I got a standing ovation, like standing ovation. So I said, okay. And I flipped this big vignette over and I said, what does the neighborhood want to see? And they would say things. And I'd say, you know, that's completely unrealistic, right? <laughs> that is ridiculous. That's <sighs> as ridiculous as my trail. And I began having this friendship with the neighborhood. And finally, one lady stood up in the back and I couldn't see her. And um, she yelled it out again. And she said, does Edge Homes even care? Or are you just placating me and us? And I went quiet. So I said what every responsible developer says. I said, Edge Homes actually doesn't give a shit. Wow. And then I said, are there any other questions? And somebody said, if Edge Homes doesn't care, then why are we here? And I said, oh, I care. Steve Maddox cares. I have my three daughters on the front row here because I promised them that we were going to do something this week. So my daughters are on the front row. And I care probably as much as anybody cares. And all of the words that you have called me are making my daughters cringe. And so, no, I care deeply. And I'm listening deeply. And I will make changes deeply. And it was in my mind, I had to delineate between an inanimate object of a company that I will never stand behind. And that's why I'm at the neighborhood meeting. And that's why I'm taking notes. And that's why this is my meeting, not an employee's meeting. And when you can help the neighborhood understand that you cannot meet all of their needs. I understand that you have had an illegal racetrack in the backyard that your little boys have raced their motorcycles on. Like, I've done it. I get that. And I'm sorry, but I can't replace that. And you can't expect me to replace that. And you have property rights. I'm not going to infringe in your backyard. I'm not going to tear down your fence and build a racetrack in your backyard. Um, but if you really bought this ground and your home thinking that the 80 acres behind you were going to stay in perpetuity, you and I probably need to go offline and have that discussion and hook you up to a polygraph because it is in fact. <laughs> but I would consider myself having relationships with individuals by the time the project is done. And um, if that takes a week or two or three or four, I will get to the point where their DNA is on the project. And I think the greatest victory is when we all show up to a city council meeting and they say, we don't love the project. In fact, we don't like the project, but we're okay with the project. And I say the same thing. I don't like the project. I don't like the expenses that they are having me do. <laughs> I don't like the trail where Paige is making me do it, but she's right. I think that's, this. I'm having so much fun over here. Um, I want to talk about <clears throat> building condos because you are one of the very few people that I know in the Valley that is building condos. And if you could talk a little bit about why that is with the litigation laws and all that stuff, why do you do that? Why not throw up for rent housing? It's so much easier. Financing's easier. It's just a lot easier than doing uh, condos, but you still do it. And I think it's awesome because the missing middle or the beginning starter home as a realtor, I sold two of your condos and they love it by the way. Um, so let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. At the beginning of my career, I did not have a microphone and I did not have the ability to do what I personally wanted to do. And, um, I was in vineyard city 
And um, I had maybe 250 people opposing what I was doing. Um, and that's fine. Like, I, I like opposition. I actually get a little bit of a buzz out of um, opposition. Um, I was not even presenting my project as a whole. I was actually in the process of, of defining what their code and ordinance allowed. And with social media, it was very, very, very apparent that neighborhoods could organize within hours. And when I started my career, it was door to door. So somebody had to be pretty ambitious to, sh to organize a mob and show up in protest. And so they had all heard, um, I believe from the mayor at the time who had said, we have a developer that's coming in and if you would like to voice your opinion on zoning, then this would be the time to do it. I knew what my rights were. I knew what the zoning allowed. I wanted to, I thought I was circumventing the neighborhood by just understanding the zoning. I received a letter um, from 42 people that did not want to be identified at the city meeting, that could not afford a home in Vineyard. And so I asked if I could speak after the neighborhood, which isn't traditional because typically they say, does the developer want to add anything? And I asked for permission to go after. So um, they spent maybe an hour with poison about individuals that they did not want in their community. And they spoke about individuals that um, were going to bring crime and going to bring with them their own set of ideology that these individuals did not share. And I began to internalize this feeling of these people all bought in 08 on their half acres for a minimal amount because the market was at an all-time low. At the time, it was represented that 89% of the residents in Vineyard could not afford to rebuy their home. But there was this, we're, we want to close the door. And I realized really quickly, I have a little bit of anger in me tonight. Like, I have a little bit of, of I think I want to, like, combat the anti-sentiment of, we don't really want people that can't afford a half acre. And it was a turning point of who is going to speak for these people who is going to speak for people who graduated from BYU and UVU that really don't have a place to live so essentially go spend five years of your life and go perhaps go to a foreign country and you know for a couple of years or a year and a half 23 years old and here's where we want to relegate you to which is the old housing in Provo and short of that, like, good luck. Go out to a place that's called Eagle Mountain or go out to a place that's called Thule or go out to these places. And I thought, man, this is really shifted from... So I thought, I'm going to read this letter. And I got through maybe a paragraph. And I stopped and I said, I guess I have to look at myself in the mirror and everybody else and just say, shame on us. Shame on us for getting in when the getting was good. And shame on us when the dream in Utah and Utah County was a half acre and a house. And shame on us for not watching what was happening. And shame on us for bragging to our friends that, hey, I got a ton of equity in my home. I've got $60,000 of equity in my home. And I can sit in the grocery store and brag about how much equity I have. Oh, I took out a HELOC. And look at this brand new Mastercraft boat I have. And I, man, I took out another HELOC. And I refinanced. And I am riding this wave massive way for years and years and years of equity that I'm creating and then condemning the poor people. And these poor people are not the poor people. They're me 10 years ago and 15 years ago. So little by little, people started leaving the meeting. And I realized that this is hard. This dynamic of affordability is hard in the state of Utah. And density is hard in the state of Utah. And wanting to preserve our way of life and heaven forbid somebody from the West Coast moves here that might be a little more liberal than us. And, and heaven forbid, you know, somebody doesn't have a cowboy hat. And heaven forbid, somebody doesn't attend church. And heaven forbid, somebody's anti-Mormon. And heaven forbid, like, who is moving my damn cheese all the time? <laughs> and I sat there at the meeting saying, I am guilty of that in which I am talking about tonight, 
which is who is representing the 50 people or the 100 people tonight. And I felt this voice of, I want to represent those that are underrepresented because the wealthy are represented. The wealthy are able to take the microphone and the wealthy are able to say, look at my house. It's, 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 it's. And the reality was I took on this, what can we do as a building community and as an individual to assure that my children and your children and their children would be represented in a world that their own parents are saying, we don't want attached housing and we don't want, and we don't want, and we don't want. And you being in the real estate world, understand this is not low income housing. This is six figure income to qualify for a condominium in our community. So I laughed because the reality was most of the people that would be buying this housing that I would consider affordable, making more money than those that had bought 10 years previously. So it became a class war. It became, uh, we don't know that we really want them. And that is still the battle that exists today along the Wasatch Front, which is we do not want high density housing. We don't want attached housing. And we think everybody's entitled to a half acre lot. But as you know, there's a cascading effect where that means that I've got to be able to go to the farmer and say, hey, your land is, you know, because of the community outcry is only worth 20% of what you think it's worth. You've farmed it your whole damn life. And your dad farmed it, but I can only pay you 20 cents on the dollar because all your neighbors think I should be able to provide housing. Um, The other nuance on this whole housing affordability crisis that we have going on in the state is our impact fees have gone up by 280% over the course of the last 12 years. That's all passed on to the consumer. So part of this was just, I believe in the American dream of owning a house because I know what that meant to my family. And since I had the microphone and somebody was willing to give me the microphone, I was willing to take it. And I think you have to believe in your message. You have to live your message. And um, I have watched my children buy homes in my communities, and I have seen changes in their disposition because of what they have been able to accomplish, which is housing affordability, and to be able to make a house payment and say, this is my house. You're making me want to go build a bunch of condos right now. So the last five, I guess really the last 10 years, even 12 years has been relatively good minus the last year or so. It wasn't always this good specifically for home builders. Let's go back to 2007, 2008. You were kind of midway through your career and then kind of the lights got shut off to put it lightly, I'd say. How did you, how did you rebound from that? One, what was going through your head? And two, how there was just destruction everywhere. How do you move forward after that? That was the tale of two cities in OE. Um, I live my personal life because of my upbringing. And I had savings, as I indicated. That two-year savings that I had accrued before 2000 had grown, and my lifestyle did not change as I started to build homes. It began to just become savings. And that's how I ran my business. And um, it was very interesting to go to banks and say, here's my financial statement. You can foreclose on me by trying to smoke me out and um, not um, helping me refinance or not helping me because rates had dropped. Um, You are saying you're not going to lend to me on vertical. We can become adversarial to each other or we can partner and we can get through this project together. And in 08, I went to every institution that we had financed with and I had that same talk and I went through my plan. I did not have a bank say no. Every bank said, marginally, we believe in you, but we're not gonna lend a ton. So I met out on a job site and I had every trade represented. And we all sat around and I said, I have day old donuts that I just picked up from the grocery store because that's all I could afford. And I've got some cocoa and you're going to listen to me and you can tell me one of two things, F you, and you can say it loud because I agree, or you can say we're on board and we'll shake hands. And I said, I want you to work for this wage. And it was essentially, I want you to work for free. And I have categorized what everybody's going to work for. And then I've categorized what I'm going to sell this home for. 
And I knew that if I hit a certain price point, I could compete with the foreclosure market. Um, Steve Coolard in my office at the time had over 400 foreclosures. And I thought this is the dumbest thing that I could ever do, which is build out of a slowdown. But I thought everybody wants new and everybody wants finished if I can hit the same price point as a foreclosure. And I always remember there was a gentleman named Joey. He still frames for me, Hercules Builder. And he said, I'm in because I can't stand being at home. I'm suicidal. And I thought, okay, like he's feeling the same way I am, which is depression, discouragement, and he doesn't know what to do, but at least he has a place to go in the morning to call it work. And then everybody, I didn't have one trade that said, no, we won't do that. So it became, it became a sanctuary for a lot of people to say, at least I have work. At least I don't have to tell my neighbors I'm unemployed. And I can remember when I was able to increase that just marginally. And I gathered everybody else and I said, everybody gets a raise. You know, it was like a half a percent raise, but at least now you're not working for free. And they had gone to their trades. They had gone to the lumber yards and the supply yards. Like we had just beat these things up to the point. So I started building out of this and I thought, I've got to cut everything down, including commissions. And I've got to be able to go to real estate agents and have the same conversation. So in 07, I was working double the hours that I was working before but at least the bleeding had stopped. At least I was not losing. I was holding my own and I had relationships with banks. And then I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm breathing and I'm going to go to the banks and I'm going to say, rather than doing one spec home, I want to do three spec homes. And I would always remind them, the auditors are breathing down your throat. Like you, you can foreclose on me in a year because I'm not going down without a fight and I'm making my payments. So we built through it. I didn't have any projects foreclosed on and I didn't lose any projects. And if you looked at my balance sheet, it was the worst year financially, but probably the most rewarding year to be able to look back. And then when the market began to change, those were the relationships with those institutions that we were able to catapult. And those were the banks that were saying, whatever you want, here's our limits. You can borrow to that limit. So I did not know what I was doing. Once again, there was not a manual. There was not, but I saw what my colleagues were doing. And I saw where they were going and I saw what happened to their lives and I saw what happened to their marriages and I saw what happened to them emotionally. And I swore to myself, there's got to be a better way than just rolling over. And, but I realized also we were disciplined on the front end of these projects. We knew what our margins were. We had paid right on the ground and we weren't frivolously developing. I can't believe you were building ground up and competing with foreclosures that blows my mind. That I remember is... the first field I tore up during the recession and I had banks calling me saying I was reckless and irresponsible because there were lots everywhere. And I thought to myself a couple of things. Um, <laughs> show me a better way. Show me a better way to make a payment on this alfalfa field because I don't have a better way. I don't have an alternative other than a bill out of it. And show me an alternative to, like, I don't have the cash to go into your institution and buy toxic lots. I just don't. You guys aren't willing to finance anything. So um, there were a couple banks that, like, are local, were locally owned and make, made local decisions, and we got through it. And it was hard at times feeling like I don't want to be that reckless, irresponsible developer, but I also don't know how to get out of this, and I'm not an alfalfa farmer. So um, I'm going to get out of this. And it was, it was um, risky at times, but the alternative was not risky, but it was detrimental to society. Like every time there was a foreclosure, it drove the price of property down. So like in my mind, it was like, no, everybody like grab a torch and like, we got to turn this market around. And every time I would turn around, I'd get another call from a bank. Hey, we just foreclosed on this. And I'm thinking in my mind, I know the developer there. I know the developer there. I know the developer there. So there was a lot of negative juju going around at that time. The positive was there were trades that were willing to work and they were working. And um, I still work with them today. That's awesome. I know along that path, somewhere along that path, you met uh, Mark Bingham from Blue Diamond Capital, sold the phone book in 2007 for a lot of money. Do you know how much? If you want to share it on the podcast, you're more than welcome. No, to. I'm not going to share it. I thought maybe oh, you yeah, know. I do. Um, I think I've, you should share it. It was upwards of 250 million. Okay, is that correct? Uh, it's a lot north of that. 
Oh, even he better. sold northern and southern. So even better. Yeah. So we'll try and get him on the show sometime. A friend of the show, Brandon Ball, works for them, and he's yeah. coming on in two weeks. Yeah. What did Mark bring to you? Was he just rocket fuel for what Edge Homes was? And also, when did you guys get introduced, and what did he do for Edge Homes? So Mark came along after Edge was established, and we had momentum. Mark had, during the downturn, purchased and developed two or 300 lots in Heber and two or 300 in Spanish Fork and really didn't want to be a builder. Um, you should have Mark on a podcast. Yeah, He might um, be the funniest person that I am still. <laughs> I would consider Mark a dad. I would consider Mark a dear friend. I would consider Mark a lot of things. But when the market was still cool, Mark came in and um, Mark has a way of talking down to you. And Mark has a way of equalizing the playing field. And Mark has a way of street fighting that I had never been around before. Kind of like my coaches when I was younger, where you felt like you were doing your best. And Mark would always say, there's more. And he came in and I realized early on that Mark, Mark had an appetite of, to, of investing and investing in people, but investing in real estate. And when we were able to put a deal together and um, we came together, I realized that Mark was the type of person I gravitated to. Mark has never seen a deal he doesn't want to sniff out. Mark has never seen a parcel of ground that he didn't want to do due diligence on. And Mark is fearless. Like I, I have met people that claim to be fearless. Mark is fearless. The, the gene that says don't do that does not exist in Mark's mind. So those same banks that I was working with had portfolios of foreclosed property like I have never seen before. So I don't want to spoil anything, but one of Mark's very favorite things in the entire world is garage sale shopping. doesn't matter what city you're in. Mark loves to go shop for garage or at garage sales. I, I had heard he was involved in like a student housing deal in, I think, Vineyard. And someone told me that like a few days before they bulldozed all of the houses, he went and stripped all the copper. Yes. That's that was awesome. a, That was our project. Um, he loves awesome. to dumpster dive and he loves to... Um, Mark will always be poor in his mind. So Mark doesn't waste. Mark drove an old pickup truck um, up until two years ago. He drives two-wheel drive because it gets better fuel economy. He owns gas stations. Everything about Mark is real, and everything about Mark translates into business. And Mark would come in all the time, and I'm a slow learn, and he would tell me, You're not, we're not selling homes. We're building a business. Like, I don't care what we're doing. We're building a business. And I would always just pat him on the back. Hey, that's really that's really nice, Mark. That's really cute. That's really cute. You picked that up along the way. So we're going into these banks, and he's looking in these three-note binders that are six inches thick. And we'd get out in the parking lot. Which one of those do you want? And I'd say, friggin' want them all. What do you mean, which one do I Which ones are the best ones? Let's go back into the bank and offer them X. He was shameless with what we were offering. And he would just say, I, and he'd pull out a checkbook and he'd set it down. He'd say, I'll write you a check for those right now. So what did Mark bring to the table? I call him Poppy. Poppy brought to the table this attitude of, I don't care if the market is what the market is because I'm, I've lived through them. Like this too will pass. So be of good cheer. Like let's go shop. And he has no shame when it comes to negotiation. And he has no shame of saying, okay, We'll just go to the next bank and we'll buy the next deal. And sure enough, that's what we were doing. So Mark and I were at a garage sale constantly for a period of a couple of years on let's go buy this, let's go buy this. So the catapult of Edge Homes was a result of Mark Bingham saying, the sun will come up tomorrow and my checkbook will cash today. So Mark was stroking <laughs> nice oh, checks man. for Edge in procuring inventory that was significantly lower. And Mark Mark's, our due diligence was what would it cost us to buy the ground, develop the ground, and then he would offer a fraction of that, and then we'd close on the property. So Mark, in my mind, will always be that friend that came along when I was tired and said, here's a cup of water. And 
you talked about growing the business. You mentioned this earlier, and I actually have this on my notes. A lot of people, they, they would love to be just a developer. They'd love to do, you know, a couple lots here, a couple lots here, maybe build a retail building, whatever that is. That's not a business, though. That's just a job. Mm-hmm. One, when did you make that shift? Was it something that Mark said? And then two, how do you think about that today? Mark took us to a Fortune 500 company event um, with people all across the nation of entrepreneurs. And um, I rented my own vehicle. Gordy rented a vehicle and Mark rented a vehicle. And um, we all showed up to a house that he owns in Arizona. And we don't know what happened, but somehow he returned all of our vehicles because it was a waste of money having three separate vehicles (laughs) down there. And um, we were driving in, I think it was a Nissan extra cab, six of us going to this event to celebrate our success as a company. And I remember being a little embarrassed, sitting down at a table, and it was the first time, and I won't say who was at the table, but they were individuals that I knew their product and I knew what their story was, and I was with like-minded people. And when we went home, it was the first time, and this was probably two and a half, maybe three years into our relationship with Mark, where it sank in what Mark was trying to tell me because I was so transactionally based, which was here's what we're making every month, here's what we're selling, who cares about growing the company. When I started looking at the valuation of companies, I asked Mark to look into the books of um, directories and understand what he was meaning. And it was at a point in my career where I understood what Mark was saying. And at that point, moving forward, it was, okay, how do we brand? How do we become something other than just somebody that builds homes? And then how do we scale this thing? And it was Mark constantly saying, companies are always built to sell. Companies are always built to sell. And it was like, Mark, I'm not going anywhere. I'm never selling. We are here forever, Mark. You and I are sealed for time and eternity, (laughs) and we will be here forever. Um, And that was the wisdom that Mark brought to the company and the partnership, which was we are building a company and a brand. Trust me. And so you ended up selling, or I, I don't know exactly how it worked, but with uh, Sumitomo Forest, Forestry America. Did I say that right? Oh, correct. That's good. Great. I only had to practice that like three times yeah. before the show. Um, how did that work? Mark and Debbie, Mark's wife. Debbie's brilliant, by the way. Debbie's brilliant, and Debbie is assertive. <laughs> um, they came into Gordy and I. And they said, it's time for us to leave the company. So I was pissed beyond. So I began to explode and say, it's not part of the deal. We didn't get into this to just dabble. Mark, you promised me you'd be here. Um, You made a lot of commitments to me, Mark, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Debbie gave me the finger. And she said, it's not about you, Steve. We should, if you're listening to this, it was the index finger. Index the, finger, yeah, which was like, the, shush. Yeah. Like, yep. shush. Yep. This isn't about you. She's not a flip-off person. Yep. She's a proper person. Um, it was the finger of shush. This isn't about you. This is about us. And Mark had gotten to an interesting place in the career of Edge. And he said, and it was, it was oddly an emotional exchange, which Mark is not an emotional person. Um. And Mark said, we have gotten to the point where I can no longer contribute to edge. The need for capital isn't there. You guys have gone past where my education is at. You guys have gone past where the company is. And I now now feel like I am a mooch on the company. So I started started to talk again because I don't feel that way. I will never feel that way. When Mark was out stroking checks, when no one else was, like Mark has a seat at the head of the table, not not on the wings. So I got the index finger again. And it wasn't it wasn't as kind the second time. It was we have made up our minds. So I looked at Mark and I was like, Mark, like you need to speak. And he's like, I can't. But this is where we're at. In order for me to maintain a friendship with you and Gordy, I have to exit. So we began the process which was awful, 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 awful. And um, we had an offer from a national company 
And I told Gordy and Mark, I can't work for a public. I have made commitments to everybody that works for me, all of our subs. I can't wear a tie to work. I can't do this. I can't do that. Like the organization and the strategy of who we are as a company and the name and who we are is too important for me to abandon. So Mark, I understand you feel like everything is built to sell. I guess you and I are wired different. Like if I'm selling, I'm not staying. Like I have to distance myself from the company and I'm going to go open up Edge Squared or I'm going to go do my own thing because I'm going to take everybody with me that I made commitments to that this would be the type of organization where you could walk upstairs and your voice would be heard. So Mark said, okay. So we were um, introduced to an individual that represented Sumitomo Forestry America. We put together a deal in very short order with the criteria that I have just described. And I don't want to say that it has been perfect, but it has been 99.99% perfect in the culture of the company. Our strategy is the company. And that was seven years ago. Um, I do not plan on surrendering my seat anytime in the near future because I love Edge Homes and the partnership that we have with Sumitomo. So Mark Bingham exited the company. He sold his ownership. Gordy and I maintain our ownership and currently uh, maintain our ownership. And um, Sumitomo did not bring anything to the edge table. We have grown organically. But again, they have brought the structural strength and integrity of a massive company and the backing of a national company. So Japanese companies love American home builders. And I'm not entirely sure why. Why do they love Japanese or why do they love home builders so much? I don't think the Japanese love American home builders. It, I've heard that before. I, I don't get a Hallmark card from them saying, we love you, Steve. Um, I don't get hugs and kisses from <laughs> my Japanese partners. Um, Japan as a country is shrinking. They do not have the birth rate that the United States has, and they do not have immigration laws that allow them to grow as a country. So their population is shrinking, and their companies are struggling as a result of that. And certainly housing is struggling as a result of that because they're not growing organically, and they do not have net immigration that allows them to grow. So years ago, strategically speaking, they thought, we've got to figure out how to maintain our country's companies and one of those outlets that they have chosen is American home building companies. Um, the reason that it works for a lot of our, the smaller companies is you have owners that want to stay on board, that want to take a bite of the apple and have the financial burden removed. And they target individuals that have a desire to stay with the companies that they have built, manage the companies that they've built, and then just um, essentially write off in the sunset when it's time to write off into the sunset. So um, they, Sumitomo proper, is at a point now where they feel like they have secured enough companies across the United States that they will probably maintain that for a season and then ask us to grow both organically but also look for opportunities to grow within regions. I want to bring this home with I don't know if there, and I've said this behind your back, I don't know if there's a company that I respect more than Edge Homes. Thank you. Because, I mean, Utah was crazy during COVID. We had so many people moving in. Interest rates were basically nothing. And you had all of these home builders who were not honoring their price, uh, honoring their contracts. And Arguably, it's fair. You know, lumber went up by you know forty thousand bucks a house or whatever it went up by. I think it's reasonable to expect a home builder to say, "Hey, like let's get even here. Your price went up eighty thousand, or your value of your home went up by eighty thousand, and my cost went up by sixty. Like, can we increase it by forty or something like that?" You didn't do that, and I think it's so cool. But why did you not do that? You had every reason to. I don't think anyone would have blamed you. People were being egregious on the other end of the spectrum. Like I saw companies increasing prices by 150,000 two weeks before someone was going to close. And you went the complete opposite direction. Why did you do that? 
Uh, that's a tough question. I have been partners with Gordy Jones for 15 years. We just celebrated our anniversary. Congrats. We've not had a fight. Um, we knew what our competitors were doing. But we also knew that we want a legacy company. And the individuals that we knew that were doing that, some of them were in financial problems. Like they had not understood their costs. And that was really sad for us to think during a great time in the market, they had underestimated or didn't estimate and had essentially gone with the flow. The item that was killing most builders is the construction time doubled or tripled because subs weren't available. So um, there was a double loss for a lot of people. And so we chose to ignore what our competitors were doing because we think that there were a lot of reasons that people were doing. I don't think it was just all even the score. I don't think it was just, I think some people were surviving. And I think there were some builders that were writing checks. And I don't think it was the most profitable time for home building as an industry. Um, our DNA goes back to 08. And so we spent as much time bidding our projects and understanding what our costs are and had prepared for this for 12 years at the time and felt like this storm will pass as well, even though this is a positive storm. This is a tailwind pushing us faster. Um, we still have to look at ourselves in the mirror, and we still have to um, be who we are and be true to who we are. And if we were in a financial crisis and I felt like the company and the financial integrity of the company was on the line, I would have felt compelled to go to homeowners and say, can we raise the price just to break even? We weren't there. And so um, there were opportunities during COVID that were, were offered by the federal government that we didn't take advantage of based on, no way. Based on um, direction from our partnership. And we certainly would not have gone back and renegotiated during um, an opportunity, if that's what we call it, um, to prove out who you are. So if we want to look back on the legacy of Edge Homes and the legacy of the individuals at at Edge Homes, our employees know that. And when our employees are greeted in the grocery store by somebody, then that's enough for us. And I know that sounds lame, and I know that sounds dated, and I know that sounds like chivalry from the 50s, and maybe, you know, leave it to Beaver influenced Gordy and I, um, that we just think that there's a better way. But the reality is, I, I think you can run a building company with integrity as well as you can any other company, and that's what we set out to do 15 years ago. We weren't going to spoil that over something as trivial as here's an opportunity to make a few more dollars. I think that's just a testament to who Edge is in just a perfect picture right there. So let's let's leave it there. Steve, this was awesome. Thank you.